Hello and welcome to another day of talks at BASCONF 2020. Today is Julia Day, where we are going to have amazing speakers talk about this new language called Julia, which we are very excited about. Our first speaker for today is one of the co-creators of the Julia programming language. Um, he is the co-founder and CEO of Julia Computing and co-author of the book Rebooting India. He is called Viral B. Shah. And we are very happy to have you, Viral. Um, you're free to start sharing whenever you want. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, and we can see your screen. Perfect. So I have, uh, you know, thank you for the introduction and uh, I am really excited to be uh, presenting the Julia language to you. Um, we are going to have, oops, I don't have my first slide here. All right, let's make sure that this is full screen. All right, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about the Julia language and, you know, what we've built and how we got here and uh, lots of interesting random things about Julia. Um, the idea is not so much to have a tutorial uh, as much as to sort of show you little bits and pieces about the Julia ecosystem so that you would then be, um, you know, interested and motivated to go and learn online about Julia and my presentation will show you how to go about doing that. Um, in the meanwhile, um, and, and this is the first talk, I, I believe the second talk after me is Chris Rakakis, who is actually gonna talk about Julia's, you know, the, the application of Julia to scientific machine learning. So I will, uh, you know, sort of let him speak about all the uh, fascinating things Julia is doing with scientific machine learning. And I'll focus a little bit more on the language aspects for my presentation here. So without further ado, uh, here we are. Now, you know, my title is Julia, a language for AI and so much more. And I'm not going to be talking a whole lot about AI for the first part of my, uh, from, of my talk. I'm going to introduce Julia to you um, and why we built it and where we are. And then we'll go from there into, uh, you know, some of the AI related things. Um, and what I would like to do is to show you that AI is not special in, in any way. Um, you know, the, the algorithms and neural networks um, and the deep learning technologies and improvements have been amazing, but from a language perspective, it is another scientific computing, um, you know, it, it's an application of scientific computing and, uh, you know, the Julia's language design is perfectly well suited um, for modern AI computations and uh, let's go to the next slide. All right, so we started the Julia project almost 10 years ago. Um, and and uh, this was the world as it looked like back then. You sort of had this two language problem where algorithm developers, the specialists, right? The, the scientists, the physicists, the data scientists, the statisticians, all these guys created their algorithms in Python, R, SAS, MATLAB. Well, maybe not Python so much 10 years ago, but you get the drift that Everyone wants to use uh, a high level a language um, in which it's easy to write your algorithms, easy to explore, plot your data, get some intuition about it. And then when you're ready with your algorithm, you want to put it into production. And that's when um, you often end up rewriting uh, either the whole application or parts of it in Java, C Sharp, C++, the so-called uh, production languages and, and that, or, or the deployment languages. And we, we thought that this was a bit wasteful. We thought that it was unfortunate that everyone had to write all their programs twice. Um, and that's why we started our work on the Julia language. And uh, Julia strives to combine the ease of use of the dynamic languages with the, the speed of the statically compiled languages. So the ease of Python, but the performance of C. The idea, of course, being that, you know, when you do this, you can bring everyone together on one platform, right? You, you know, your domain specialists, as well as your programmers, your IT, all the people would then be on one platform and they're able to contribute to the same code base. 
you know, the algorithms can be explored in the same code base. And then with a single click, you can send it to deployment. You don't have to write it again. And this compresses the innovation cycle, lets you do so much more with the Julia language. Um, and uh, take, you know, if you're a researcher, it helps you get your PhD faster or, you know, find, you know, if you're a scientist, it accelerates the course of scientific discovery. If you're a company, it helps you take a product to market much faster and much cheaper than your competitors. So there is real value to, you know, uh, to sort of solving this two language problem in, in a meaningful way. So I would like to start out by saying, so, you know, we have this saying in the Julia community that, uh, you know, people come for the performance, but they end up staying for the experience. And I will start out with the performance slides. I'll, I'll talk about what brings people to Julia really. And here I have a, a series of benchmarks. Um, these benchmarks are in comparison with, uh, a lot of these benchmarks are comparing with Python, with R, um, and with many of the other languages. So let me just walk through them a little bit. So the first one out here, um, I assume you can see my mouse uh, as, I, as I move it around. Uh, yes, yes one, we can. Perfect, thank you. So the first one is this computer language benchmarks game, uh, which was uh, you know, uh, run by the Debian project for the longest time and has recently been upgraded to include many new modern languages. Um, and this is a graph from the benchmarks game. Uh, these are a number of different benchmarks that you have to implement. And as you can see, a, a C++ and GCC and Rust, your typical statically compiled languages do very well on performance. Whereas languages like um, um, MATLAB or Python or R don't even show up on this list because you know those 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 go further out to the right. They didn't fit on this graph. Um, but Julia is right here. It's right next to Fortran, right? It's it's in the company of all these really high performance, fast languages. Um, but if you look at sort of all the languages around Julia, none of them have the ease of use of Julia. And you'll see what I mean by the ease of use uh, very shortly. Um, I, I, yeah, so if, if you go to this computer language benchmark scheme website, you can see where the other languages rank. And, uh, you know, this, this graph shows, you know, if you're at one, you're as fast as C. If you're at 300, then you are 300 times slower than C. And a lot of the languages uh, that are like Julia, that are dynamic like Julia, end up being significantly slower. And the ones that are as fast as Julia tend to be much harder to work with. Um, you'd have to write a lot more lines of code to do the same thing. So Julia sort of occupies this sweet spot of performance and productivity. However, here are some other uh, interesting findings. So here's, uh, you know, the, the second graph I have here is graph processing in Julia. And we are comparing it with, we are comparing many different data sets. This is actually the work uh, done by the light graphs people, Seth Bromberger and um, James Fairbanks, bunch of guys um, and, uh, and what we find is that Julia is significantly about 100x faster than Python, and it matches the performance of many of the handwritten uh, graph libraries in C. Um, the next book uh, I have is this parallel k-means implementation, where Julia turns out to be 100x faster than some of the algorithms uh, in scikit-learn. Um, going forward, I have some database, uh, some data operations out here. So this is a hundred million rows by nine columns, five gigabytes of data. And uh, you have sort of uh, comparisons between Spark, Julia's data frames, um, Python with the data tables library, Pandas, Dplyr in R and so on and so forth. This is a group by benchmark and uh, Julia does extremely well, highly competitive with Spark um, using much fewer resources. Um, this benchmark has many other things. And uh, I, I should point out that while on the group by benchmark, we do really well. Some of the other benchmarks like join, we have some work to do. So everything is not 100% um, you know, uh, better with Julia. And I'll be the first one to say that. But we are already uh, you know, hugely better on a number of common data processing, data loading, um, you know, uh, machine learning tasks, proce uh, graph processing tasks, and much more um, than any of the other languages. And the final benchmark I, I have here is CSV loading. You know, often a lot of your data processing is just how fast can you load your data? And, and a lot of the data out there is in CSV files. And Julia turns out to be often, you know, uh, not often in all the cases, 
but in the best case here, 30x faster. And it is the, uh, not the only one, Julia is able to use threads. R can also use threads. Python and Pandas by default do not use threads. I believe you can get threading and faster load times with Arrow. Um, and I, I believe that Wes McKinney and crew are doing a lot of interesting work in Python there. However, Julia is here, it's, to, you know, it's loading CSV files in parallel, um, in line with the rest of your computation, just extremely fast. And uh, that's csv.jl, that's Jacob Quinn's package. Um, so this is, this is just a very you know, quick tour of the Julia ecosystem and, and how we do with Julia and performance. Um, now, one of the things I wanted to point out about Julia is that, is that it has a fantastic package manager and the Julia package manager is geared for full reproducibility. So what that means is that, you know, when you write your package, you get to define a project file, which will include all the dependencies of your project, all the version bounds, all the good stuff. Um, and, and, and this thing is, is incredibly uh, high quality. So we have, Julia has over 300 uh, open source packages already. Um, sorry, over 3,000. Actually, we hit 4,000 today, so I should correct that. Julia has over 4,000 open source packages. However, you can call any C or Fortran or Java or Python or R library from Julia. And in fact, um, especially for binaries like uh, you know those that are built with C and C++, Julia provides a fantastic system for you to download them in pre-compiled form. Um, for all your operating systems, whether you're on Mac, Linux, OS X, and so on and so forth. And I'll show a little bit of those demos there. But the Julia package ecosystem has been designed with two goals in mind, which is it should, you know, it's, it's like uh, the, the packages themselves are language agnostic in the sense that you can have binaries and dependencies and all kinds of things in them, you can have data dependencies. And the second thing is reproducibility that you can actually, um, you know, go two, or two years, three years, four years out from now, and you'll be able to check out the exact same version of your code uh, along with the exact same versions of all the dependencies you needed uh, to run it. And Julia's gonna do all that for you. I'm going to talk a little bit about just, just this one slide about the language design and then sort of pop back out one level before I do my demos. But one of the things that makes Julia interesting is multiple dispatch. Now, a lot of people uh, you know, ask what, you know, what's, what's so great about multiple dispatch. And here's an amazing example from Chris Rakakis, who's, who's the speaker who's gonna come after me, where you know, we have a simple differential equation. Don't think about what this differential equation is actually doing, but it's just um, simulating a pendulum, right? So it's just going uh, like a pendulum. Um, but instead of just predicting the motion of the pendulum, we now want to you know, put in an error term in the measurements, right? Um, just because, uh, you know, any physical experiment, any observation, you never get perfect data. You always have error in your measurements. And uh, what happens is in Julia, we have the differential equations.jl package for simulating the, the, the physics of this thing, of the pendulum. But we have a separate package called measurements.jl, which is how you track errors. Now, these two packages were written completely independently of each other. But it turns out that if you give measurements to the differential equations package, if you give you know, this plus minus sign out here, right? So what it's saying is that the gravitational constant G is 9.79 .9 meters per second square with an error of 0 0.02. Um, and similarly, the length of the pendulum has this 0 0.01 error in its measurement. Now, we, uh, and we also have um, the, you know, the measurement errors in the, in the initial speed and angles as well. And then we give it the time span and then we run our experiment. And what happens is not only do you get your final answers back with the error bars, but you also get a plot with the error bars automatically. I mean, this is just incredible to see this level of uh, composition. And this is what happens in the Julia ecosystem that a person writes package A, another person comes and writes package B, but because of the design of the language and the collaborative nature of the ecosystem, things that were not designed to work with each other end up working very well. And a lot of this is possible due to the power of multiple dispatch. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about multiple dispatch when I do a demo, but I wanted to you know, just demonstrate something. I wanted you guys to have a picture in your mind about what multiple dispatch is. And I, I personally find this to be a fantastic uh, picture in my mind um, about what it can enable. 
a lot of people, uh, you know, ask who's using Julia. You know, a lot of people come to me and say, "I love Julia. I, I'm using it out there." Um, you know, but you know, I have a, a friend who's using Julia in the university or in my office. But you know, I, you know, not everyone around me is using Julia, so my boss is not going to approve of it. And I, I usually say that there are actually half a million Julia users out there. There are over ten thousand companies who have downloaded Julia, and these are just some of the names. Uh, some of the names of all the interesting companies, many of these are Fortune 500 companies across a number of different domains like in pharma, in energy, in entertainment, a lot of the US national labs, um, just so many consulting firms, everyone out there is using Julia. So even if you are using Julia and you find that uh, no one else in your immediate vicinity or in your social circles using Julia, um, we have a bunch of data to, to prove uh, to everyone else why, you know, that, that this Julia thing is not a small thing. It's actually quite big. It has a very large community. The Julia discourse, for example, discourse.juliaLang.org, our mailing list, has over uh, 5,000 people on it. Uh, I might even be 10,000 by now. The Julia Slack has over 5,000 people on it. And the numbers are just staggering. Julia has seen over 10 million downloads by now. A lot of universities are teaching Julia. These are just some of the logos of the universities that are teaching Julia. And uh, you know, these are just the ones that we could fit on one slide. But as you can see, you know, MIT, it, it's got Stanford, it's got Cornell, it's got Berkeley. Um, it's got all these universities, all the top universities in the United States, in Europe, you know, just universities across the world. Everyone is teaching Julia now. Um, and if, uh, you know, if you'd like to see Julia in your classes, uh, we also provide a bunch of uh, lecture material, open source coursework um, at juliacademy.com. There's just a phenomenal amount of stuff out there that makes it easy for anyone to get started with either learning Julia or with teaching Julia themselves. All right, so I, I actually just pointed out these things, uh, although we just hit 4,000 packages today, but we've had over 10 million downloads, uh, 10,000 companies, like I said, the IEEE Spectrum Programming Language rankings came out and Julia was ranked in the top 20, which I think was a, was a great deal. Um, we were at 23 last year um, and we've now uh, gone up the ranks. Um, the Nature Magazine, which is a top most scientific journal, uh, had a fantastic article about Julia last year, or it might even be two years ago. Um, sorry, it was last year, so August 2019. So the nature article, nature, uh, this is, this is uh, if you Google this article, you can find it and it talks about how Julia is making so many interesting strides and in, uh, so many, uh, you know, it, it, it's just making its entry into so many different disciplines one by one. And it's, it's just hard to sort of keep track of it. Um, Julia has been used for running at, at at the scale of the world's largest supercomputers, as well as it runs on the Raspberry Pis, right? So it, it just highly portable, works incredibly well, um, supports so many different applications. All right, uh, some people want to know if there are books on Julia and, and there is a book uh, for many different topics in Julia, whether it is linear algebra or you just want to learn the language, um, optimization algorithms, this book uh, by Michael Kokenfender uh, is from uh, Stanford University. Uh, it's it's also a fully a pure Julia book. Uh, Tobin Tobin Driscoll has a fantastic Fundamentals of Numerical Computing book in Julia. If you want to learn um, operations research of uh, you know the jump package in Julia is a fantastic package for doing operations research, and uh, that's a fantastic library out there. Uh, uh, this book is a fantastic tutorial for teaching you how to use jump from Julia. Um, there's an HPC book by Avik Sengupta, data science book um, uh, by Julia out here from CRC Press. There's a hands-on computer vision with Julia. And, and there are just so many more books uh, on Julia out there. If you go to julialang.org, you'll be able to find them. All right, so hopefully I've been able to sort of showcase, you know, where the Julia language has come in all these years and, you know, how we got started. Uh, why we created the language and uh, and the, pro the progress it has been the, the progress that has been made. All right, so I'd like to switch to some demos, but I also want to pull up a web browser here and quickly show you a couple of interesting links. So here we go with julialang.org, and this is just the website. 
if you want to download Julia, you just click download and you get all the versions here, um, all the different operating systems, all the different architectures. You can download it for Windows, Mac, Linux. Um, it also runs on ARM, it runs on FreeBSD. Um, it's just, it's just uh, it pretty much runs on everything that you care about. Um, a lot of people will want to use an IDE and I will be showing Visual Studio Code, uh, uh, you know, running Julia. So that's, uh, that's going to come, come up just right away. Um, if you want to, you know, get a hold of the documentation, the Julia documentation is right here at docs.julialang.org. And we have a fascinating manual. It's incredibly well, uh, well written and it's extremely detailed. Uh, for example, here's the section on the sorting functions. Oh, sorry, I wanted to show the manual, right? So there we go. So there we go with, uh, you know, here's your introduction and, you know, here's how you do meta programming in Julia or, you know, how do you call external programs and C and Fortran codes? It's just uh, a fantastic uh, oh, profiling, stack traces, debugging, all, all the good stuff. It's all available in the Julia manual. All right, let's go back to julialang.org. All right, so here are all your learning resources. Uh, here's all the research resources. So, uh, and here are all the community resources in, you know, for Julia. Um, we have an active calendar. If you, if you notice that this calendar is extremely busy this week, and that is because JuliaCon, just like BuzzConf, we have our own conference, JuliaCon, which is actually going on at this very moment. And if you'd like to join, you can go over to juliacon.org um, and, and it's similarly online and free if you want to learn more about Julia. Um, so so that's, uh, that's what I wanted to show here. Um, I would, if you're curious about the actual reason for why we started Julia, I would look at this why we created Julia blog post from 2012. And this really explains, you know, in a, in, in a nutshell, why the Julia program project was started. Uh, this, even though we started the project 10 years ago, it was in 2012, about eight years ago that we, um, put out this first blog post outlining in great detail what we actually wanted. And the answer is we are greedy and we wanted the best of all the languages uh, um, and, and all the ease of use and the performance and scalability and parallel computing and all kinds of stuff. All right. So with that, I think it would be, you know, I've spoken enough about Julia itself. So it might be a good idea to now actually run some code. Okay. So here I have, you know, this is Visual Studio Code and I have this uh, up and running. Here's what a, a Julia function looks like. Um, you know, and I'm going to compute pi in a particular way. Um, remember that, so one of the things I'm going to do here is something that you would never do for a, in an interpreted language like um, a Python or Octave or MATLAB or R, which is you never write a for loop in there which goes over millions of elements because the interpreter is gonna be extremely slow. Julia is a JIT compiled language, so it's perfectly fine for you to write a for loop like this in Julia, but let's actually do some, some more simple things. So, you know, once you start Julia, uh, you can ask it, you know, what's, what version am I running? And we are running Julia 1.4.2. Um, and it tells us, it tells us what Julia thinks about us, right? So it's running on a 64 bit system. This is a CPU Julia has detected. That's your uh, operating system that Julia has detected. And, and if you ever run into a bug or a code, it's very important to have this information handy. Um, a bug in your, a bug in a, if you ever run into a bug that might be not in your code, but you suspect is in Julia, this would be what you would have to report to us in the community. By the way, the Julia project has over 1000 contributors today. The open source project, actually I should, I really must, I, I have to show you guys this. So you've got, if I go to Julia Lang, Julia here, so there we go, um, 1,022 contributors uh, to the open source project. I mean, this is phenomenal. Um, it is one of the large, uh, one of the very large projects on GitHub, one of the largest programming language projects on GitHub. You look at the number of stars and forks and just the number of issues and pull requests. I mean, the project is immense and it's huge. Um, and, and of course, this does not count any of the people working on the, on the package manager. And, and of course, all the users who don't show up on GitHub necessarily, but uh, are, 
are using it and, and telling their coworkers and their advisors and their bosses uh, to bring Julia into the workplace. So it's, it's a fascinating community and that has been the best part of, uh, of starting the project for myself and, and seeing it mature and sort of develop all these amazing capabilities. But I digress. All right, so back here. So, you know, I do a one plus one, so you got a two, that's good, it works. You know, what if I do a sine of phi and I get yeah, something that's almost zero, so that works. Notice that I used Unicode very quickly and uh, silently out here. And the way I did it is I typed slash PI, just like in LaTeX and then tab. So I can use all the Greek symbols I want um, or any Unicode symbol. And, and this is what, what you get. I would like to take a quick pause at this point. If, uh, if there are any questions, I don't mind being interrupted from the audience. So every once in a while, I don't mind checking, uh, you know, what that looks like. Uh, we will have a uh, space for questions at the end, but if anyone wants to start asking, uh, you're free to do it now, now that Viral has given us permission to. Yes, perfect. So, you know, I'm not looking at the chat, but if someone can interrupt me and, and ask the question, that would be perfect. But in the meantime, let's keep moving along. So, you know, one of the first things you want to do is, uh, you know, you did your one plus one, you did your pi, you know, um, you know, uh, one of the things I love is getting a random number. So I type rand and I get that. One of the most useful things you want to do is, 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 is plot something, right? And so the way to do plots is you go using plots um, and we're just going to plot a random walk. So this is, this is my plotting function out here. I'm going to, you know, on, on the x-axis plot, you know, the numbers one to uh, 10,000. We have a quick question here. Uh, does it use Latex for the symbolic writing? Um, it's a great question. We use the Latex shortcuts, but we are not actually using Latex at all within Julia itself. Julia is very good integration with Latex, but when you see my screen out here in, in the Julia shell, um, that is all built into Julia. All those command lines and bindings and all the all the stuff is built into Julia. But I'll show some interesting things. You can use a lot more mathematical operators and fun stuff that you're used in LaTeX with the same names um, in Julia, but you do not need LaTeX installed. All right, in the meanwhile, now we're going to plot this thing. So this is a random walk. Uh, think of this like your stock market or your Brownian motion. Um, um, or, or whatever random process that you'd like to think. And if I keep running it again and again, you can see that I'm in sort of updating this plot uh, in real time here. Um, and that's, uh, that's 10,000 points. I can, I can go and do a million points and that's going to take a lot more time. All right, okay. Um, so, you know, this is, this is a very basic walkthrough. So, you know, I've got, you know, we've got, we started doing some some simple things now. One of the things that people love to ask me is, um, oh, that was I pointed way, I plotted way too many points, so now it's catching up with me there. But anyways, um, a lot of people ask me how is Julia so fast, right? Because uh, if if I did these same programs, if I wrote the same for loop in Python, and I haven't executed this program yet, but if I did this, it would be forty to fifty times slower. So the question is why? Why is Julia fast? What makes Julia fast? And it's you know, some, you know I, I like to often give a technical answer like, oh, it's because of multiple dispatch or it's because of our compilation to LLVM. Um, uh, we have a quick request. Could, could you please zoom in into the, the console because uh, people might not be able to see the code. So I do not know if I can, unfortunately. I'm able to make it bigger. Oh, is, is this better? I think it's a bit better. Okay. It's a bit better, I think, yes. All right. But now I'll have to scroll a bit. So that's the only downside, which is fine. All right. So, you know, one of the things that people always ask me, like I said, is what makes Julia fast? And the answer, I always ask them that, you know, you know that the Ferrari is a fast car, right? But what makes, what makes a Ferrari fast, right? I mean, could you have taken a, a Honda Civic and put on you know, put on a fast engine and remove a bunch of stuff from the car that you don't want, reduce its weight and, uh, you know, put some fancy fuel in it. And is it going to run fast? No, it's not going to happen. Um, the reason a Ferrari runs fast is because it was designed to be fast, which means that every, des every design decision was made with an eye towards performance. 
And that is what really makes Julia fast. And that is why you cannot take an existing language and just make it as fast as Julia. You can't take, um, let's say the R interpreter or the Python interpreter and, and simply just add LLVM to it and make it fast. You have to change the language semantics. At that point, it is no longer the original language. Um, it has become a new language. Julia, when it started its life, it's, it's relatively younger. We are only 10 years old as opposed to Python and R that are 20, 30 years old or MATLAB maybe 40 years old. Um, so we were able to start out with this amazing base of uh, building on top of LLVM and doing interesting uh, you know, compiler technology uh, in, in, in today's world. And that's what really makes Julia fast. It's that every design, de design decision within Julia was made with an eye towards performance. Um, so one of the things that I'd like to do is open the hood and, and look under, you know, uh, look under the hood, right? So one of the things you can do is look at the assembly code that Julia generates. So I'm doing, you know, at code native and I'm doing one plus one. So here's the assembly that Julia generates uh, for, for this uh, operation. It's probably doing, uh, it's probably optimizing it away, but the point is you can actually look at it. Um, so let's take maybe a small vector here. So I have 10 random values and then I'll sum them up. So I get sum of A and I can look at the code that was generated. Right, so here's the code that Julia generates to do the sum of A. And I mean, the goal here is not to sort of read this assembly code, but, but the fact that you have access to something like this makes it so much easier for library writers um, to look at what's going on under the hood. If you don't get the performance you are expecting, you're going to, um, you know, you're going to have to sort of, you know, uh, look look under the hood and figure out what's going on. And Julia makes it possible to do this. This is just one of the compiler introspection tools I'm showing, but we have a fantastic debugger, a fantastic profiler. Um, uh, you know, we, we have uh, you know many other tools that would sort of that would let you analyze your code and do a lot of interesting things with it. But um, that's not the purpose of this talk. So I'm going to move on. I'm going to kill this plot. I think you all know that I can plot. Uh, in Julia now, and so can you. Um, so here's a Julia function that's computing pi, and uh, you know if I just go ahead and hit enter here, um, shift enter and shift enter, this is what's happening. Okay, so let me do that again. This is I'm computing pi with a thousand random draws, and now I'm going to do it with a million random draws. So notice that you know it was able to do that in a fraction of a second, and you know when I gave it a million random draws versus thousand, it gave me a much more accurate value of pi. We can actually com compare it with the actual pi that 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 is included within Julia itself, and minus um, let's say compute pi of ten to the power six, and and we got that close. Turns out this Monte Carlo algorithm that does a for loop and random draws is not a great way for you to, um, to calculate pi. Oh, by the way, if I'm, if I'm hovering my mouse on this rand function, I can actually see um, the help for that function here, which is, uh, which is really nice. And all of this is fully integrated using the VS Code uh, Julia plugin. Um, if you're interested in downloading it, you just go to julia-vscode.org and it gives you the you know, it tells you how to download this plugin. All right. Um, now I want to talk about, I'm not going to talk about this parallel jobs yet, but I'm going to come to it very quickly. Uh, let me do, oops, that is Slack. That's not what I want. Um, what I want is to show you that I can run code on GPUs with the same level of effectiveness. So I have another Visual Studio session going on, but this one, is actually remotely logged into a GPU computer. And now I have a simpler version of my code to calculate pi. This one is not using for loops, it's using vectorized examples, uh, vectorized functions. So I'm using the Julia map function. Um, here I have an anonymous function and uh, you know, I'm just going to sort of evaluate this function or the entire input range and then just sum it up and divide it. It's a very simple formula and uh, this is what I would do. So if I wanted to run this on the CPU, this is what I would do. And I'm going to put it here and go like that. Okay. So, okay. 
let me do this again. So I just pasted this code right here. And uh, you know, this is kind of running on the CPU. Now I want to use GPUs. So all I do is I add CUDA to my program. So I say using CUDA and then I go, instead of giving it one colon N, which is a range on a CPU, I'm now gonna give it a GPU. So if I say type of X, this is now a CU array, it's a CUDA array, as, as opposed to type of Y, which was uh, you know, a unit range on the CPU. And now I go PyCalc of Y. So note that it's the same code. I'm calling this same exact function. There is no change in my code and I'm now able to run it on the GPU. Um, I can, oh, by the way, I can switch to the shell by pressing the semicolon button. And if I go NVIDIA SMI, I can see what GPUs I have and, and so on and so forth. Um, and then this is, this was my GPU and this was my CPU. Um, as you can see, they're sort of slightly different, um, very, just, just very, very tiny bit, but um, this is, uh, this is, this is, here it is. Uh -huh. So here we have Julia running on the GPU. All right. Now with this, I'd like to go back to my presentation. So how does all of this come back to AI? You might be wondering, you know, I have shown you some language, I've shown you syntax, I've shown you high performance, I've shown you GPUs. The message that you have to take home is you do not need to write C++ to get high performance in Julia, to run in parallel, to run on GPUs. You can write code at a very high level and get it to run on GPUs. Um, and that is precisely what you need for your AI algorithms. Yann Lacoon has very famously pointed out that deep learning has outlived its usefulness as a buzz phrase, long live differentiable programming. And many luminaries in the, in the field have talked about the need for having new programming languages for AI. Chris Rakakis is actually going to talk a lot more about the in-depth language features. So I'm going to move along um, uh, a little bit faster here. So here's a Google.ai head, Jeff Dean on Julia. He talked about how Julia runs on TPUs and that's fantastic for uh, fast and easily expressible ML computations. One of the reasons why Julia makes a great AI language is its 4,000 package ecosystem. It has fantastic packages for operations research, deep learning, data science, differential equations, image processing, reinforcement learning, you name it and it exists in Julia. And this is really why it's good for AI because at the end of the day, AI is not about just doing convolutional neural networks, right? You want to combine your neural networks with your domain specific code, with your scientific code, with your business code, um, do all these different uh, interesting things with it. And Julia lets you compose. It's very hard to compose these things um, in, in PyTorch and TensorFlow. And Chris is going to talk a lot more about that. But Julia makes it effortless and easy. Um, you do not need to do, um, you know, so for example, if you need to load a data set in Julia for your AI calculations, you just go and load your data using the CSV reader or, uh, or an image reader that is generic and that works for the rest of the language. You don't have to do anything special, for example. So I want to show uh, a, a really cool uh, AI example. This is the Alpha Zero. Um, you see, this is the Alpha Zero thing. And this is, uh, everyone knows the DeepMind Alpha Zero. It was one of the largest calculations uh, done uh, in order to beat Go, the, you know, the, the top world uh, Go player. And then, you know, that was Alpha Go, but then they came up with the Alpha Zero uh, system that could then play uh, these games uh, that could self-train and play many different kinds of games, Go, chess, and so on and so forth. Um, and Jonathan Lora from uh, Carnegie Mellon University is the author of a Julia implementation of the Alpha Zero package. Only 2000 lines, very well documented, pure Julia code, very easy to read. You can jump in and see what's going on. And the code is incredibly scalable. It, it comes with distributed computing built in on each node in the distributed system. It can use multi-threading and then it will use CUDA for doing the neural network evaluations, uh, the GPUs. So it is a very complex parallel code and all of this just runs perfectly fine in Julia. So I have a quick demo for you that I'll run here. Um, and this is running Julia on the cloud. So remember, this is the same VS code system that I had. Um, I have my code on the top left out here. And uh, you know, I have my parallel server con configuration on the right hand side on the top. And what I'm going to show you now is that you have this amazing code, which used to take 10 or 12 hours to run on a single CPU with a, with a small GPU attached to it. 
by simply connecting it to Julia Hub, which is a cloud computing service offered by Julia Computing, the company that I run, uh, that I'm the CEO of, uh, along with my co-founders. Um, you can simply, with the click of a button, submit this job to run on many nodes out there on the cloud and get a, a really uh, fast experience, right? So from the, this computation went down from 10 hours to something like uh, something between one and two hours. And you can you know, get all the, all the data sets back from the cloud after submitting them when the job is over. You can plot it, you can do all this fun stuff. But after you've trained this alpha zero, the question is, you know, what do you do next? So, you know, the, the best thing that you want to do next is play a game with it. So here we go. Um, this is actually not the chess game, but it's a connect four game, which is, you know, the, the, the children's connect four game where you drop these little blue and red things um, in there. And you can, uh, let me just go back a little bit. This is a pre-recorded demo, but excuse me. So this is what your, you know, your board looks like and you're dropping these, you know, blue and red pieces. Um, in each of these columns. And, you know, if you get four in a row, then you win. And uh, after training this thing in a couple of hours, you're able to now just go ahead and play against the computer and see how it's doing. And it turns out that it actually does quite well, you know, from a few hours of training. So Alpha Zero is exactly the kind of thing that the Julia ecosystem was meant to enable with just a few thousand lines, 2000 lines of code, it leverages, you know, the Julia GPU ecosystem, the Julia compiler, it leverages, uh, you know, all the beautiful uh, terminal plotting capabilities. It uh, uses the Flux ecosystem uh, for neural network evaluation, the KNET ecosystem. It just you reuses so much of Julia that the actual machine learning is very small. Uh, a single person can do what a large team of people had done before and, and really make this thing accessible and fun to work with and play. All right. So... I'm almost towards the end of my presentation here. All right. So here's, uh, you know, so that was Alpha Zero. That was a little bit more academic uh, and research oriented, but one of the coolest things that has been done um, in the recent past um, in our community. Um, on the other hand, here's uh, Pfizer, one of the world's largest drug, man, you know, drug companies. And, uh, you know, they're using Julia to speed up a lot of their, um, pharma computations. And so here's an example where, you know, Julia was brought in to replace an, an existing MATLAB program. It ran 26 times faster. Um, uh, simply when you just moved it from MATLAB to Julia it was 26 times faster already. Once you parallelized it with multi-threading 115 times faster. And then if you brought in the GPU, it was 175 times faster, right? And so you can just see that with very little effort with tiny tweaks in the code, you can just get so much better, so much faster and scale it on clusters and GPUs and clusters of GPUs. Um, and and this, is, this is incredible for the process of drug development and the savings that it leads to. Um, we are working very closely with one of our partners, Pumas.ai, uh, which is building all these amazing pharma tools uh, in the field of personalized medicine. Um, I already mentioned JuliaCon. Um, so JuliaCon is going on tomorrow is the last day of the conference. It's, got, it's free. So please do come and check it out and hang out with our community on the Discord channel um, and try it out. And that is my last slide. So, you know, uh, this is my commercial slide here that, you know, we run a company that supports the open source Julia development and uh, supports the commercial users of Julia through our products. We offer support. We offer, a, you know, Julia Share, which is our support product, Julia Team for collaboration, Julia Run for scaling and deployment, which I actually showed a very tiny demo of uh, in the Alpha Zero. And if you want to learn Julia, you can go to juliaacademy.com. It's completely free. A lot of companies are using Julia. Many of them are our customers. And uh, please join the community. Please join the fun. And we, we are here to help. Thank you. Thank you, Vidal. Um, it was a great talk, really. And I think you made a very compelling case uh, for the ease of use, the practicality, and the speed of Julia. Um, as you might know, BASCONF is a conference uh, originated in Argentina, and many of our audience are in Argentina. And so we wanted to know how to best uh, promote the language here uh, in a country that perhaps is a bit in the periphery of the main uh, technological development. 
And we, we are um, trying to encourage a strong uh, programming community that is connected with the rest of the world. And we wanted to know how to best uh, be an advocate for the language here and how to encourage uh, programmers and companies to use it. What are the main questions you get and how would you answer them? Yeah, no, that's a fantastic question, right? Um, and and I'm, I'm I'm thrilled to see that that you know there is there is sort of this interest in in taking Julia into new geographies. I definitely know that within South America we get a lot of contributions from Brazil, for example. Um, I've seen some users from Argentina uh, on the Julia channels, um, on the Julia uh, community channels, like on Slack and Discourse, um, and and that is of course how I was invited to uh, to give this talk here. The, the important thing is that the internet is a great leveler, right? So, you know, in the olden days, you would have to go to the MITs or the Harvards in order to do cutting edge things. But with the internet, everything is just so much, uh, you know, so much more accessible. So like I already pointed out, Julia Academy is a great place to start learning Julia. It has fantastic um, um, things to offer. So let me just load that site up just so that I can show you what it has. Um, and there we go. So if you go look all courses, so you know there are plenty of courses here on Julia taught by some of the best experts. So that's a great way to get started with Julia. If if you want to get companies involved with Julia, I would suggest um, you know on the Julia Computing website we have a lot of case studies about how people are using Julia in the industry. Um, so there's so many you know amazing case studies out here about Julia in the industry. And you know that's that's another good resource to point out, but fundamentally the community is open source. So just come join on this course, say hi, download it, try it out, and and just you know join the community, um, ask questions to get help, and once you learn a little bit more, help the others, and that's how the community is grown. I think uh, you know virtual hackathons. You know in in the non-pandemic times we would have had. A physical hackathon, but in the pandemic times, probably a virtual hackathon is something that would be worth doing. Um, colleges should start teaching Julia, but I know that that's easier said than done. I, I think the the best way for us to get started building a community is from the grassroots, is individual open source users and contributors going out there, learning, trying it out, and doing um, doing what I did, but uh, uh, doing some of these tutorials in the local language, uh, you know, because uh, that will be the way to sort of, you know, get it going. I, I hope that helps. Great. Yes. Um, I will read some more questions from, from our audience. Um, uh, Ivan Mindlin says, I just read Julia's compiler is called just ahead of time in the community. Is that just a manner of speech or is it really a true hybrid between the two modes? Yes. It, it is actually a true hybrid because uh, Julia, you know, I, I, uh, I think you were very, uh, you're paying attention when I said it's a JIT compiler, but you're absolutely right. It's actually a JAOT compiler. And what happens is that when, you know, when I first press enter in the Julia terminal, uh, you know, that program is going to get compiled down to native code and then that code is executed. So it is getting compiled just at runtime, just before running. And that's why it's a JAOT compiler. Great. Um, Sebastian Rodriguez asks, uh, he says, thanks for this wonderful talk. Where can I get some real examples with statistics of Julia compared with the other languages like Java or Python? Well, I think the IEEE Spectrum uh, language rankings was a, was a great place to get the statistics. Um, the Julia computing website also has a lot of statistics, but obviously those are only for Julia itself. Um, you know, like these ones out here. Um, I would say the IEEE spectrum rankings is a pretty good one for getting the, the, the language usage statistics. Okay, great. Um, another question is um, where do you see Julia in five years? And I think this is a, a tricky one, um, but what are your plans and how do you also plan to stay ahead of the other languages because uh, it's not a race that perhaps you win uh, and that's it, but uh, it has to be continually evolving. Uh, so what are your plans for the near future? That's, uh, that's an excellent point. Uh, you know, five years ahead is too long in an open source project. Um, we have been at it for about 10 years now and I'm sure we will be at it uh, for much longer. Um, 
but a lot of the language development is driven by the community, right? Um, the the, the co-founders of the project, the co-creators of Julia, there were just four of us, but like I pointed out, there were a thousand people, there are a thousand people who have contributed to Julia as it exists today. So Julia will become what it needs to become in five years uh, based on what the community of users wants it to be and what the community of contributors builds. Um, I don't think of this as a race uh, uh, and it, it, it's, 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 you know, not about winning or losing, it's about building a robust open source ecosystem, right? So I, I gave you a lot of examples showing Julia much faster than Python or R, but the purpose of that was not in, in terms of a race that you should you know, give up on Python or R and start using Julia. The idea is that as a data scientist, as a programmer, you now have a richer set of tools and many more options available than you had before. And Julia can do some things that Python or R could not do. Um, and it interoperates with these languages. So think of it as another tool in your toolbox uh, rather than sort of throwing away your old tools and having a new tool. And uh, Julia can already do lots of things that existing tools could not do. But if you had to pick on one thing that we are working on aggressively right now, it's automatic differentiation. So that's a major compiler language capability that we are adding to Julia over the next uh, few months. We've been at it for a while, but you know we've really started sort of uh, preparing the compiler for doing that. There are fantastic talks at JuliaCon if you're interested more in it. Um, but we really uh, believe in this idea of differentiable programming and that any user written code should be just so much, should be just straightforward to, to differentiate and run on the GPU and get performance on. Um, some of the other things I would, I, I imagine we'll see over the next few years is, while Julia is already much better at parallel computing than many other languages, I expect that that support will get even better and you'd be able to run Julia on, you know, uh, today running Julia on thousands, tens of thousands of cores is straightforward, but millions, tens of millions of cores, uh, if that, uh, you know, if, if people want to do that. Um, that was a great answer. And one of the points you make is that uh, Julia will go wherever the community leads it. And so I was wondering, um, how do you get that community to be involved uh, and how do you nurture it to keep people um, uh, continue to be interested in, in, in um, uh, evolving the language? So that's a great question. So, you know, the, the, the nurture, nurturing the Julia community has been so something that many of us who started the project and many of us who are core contributors to Julia spend a lot of time doing. You see us hanging out on discourse and Slack and interacting with the users a fair bit. Um, the Julia language nat naturally evolves. So one of the things that we've done is made the Julia language, the compiler and all the underlying tooling uh, be extremely modular and replaceable. So for example, you can come in and add passes to the Julia compiler in, in user space you know, without rewriting the compiler or the code. You can come and inject new passes into the compiler. You have, uh, you know, we have metaprogramming, so you can create domain-specific languages in Julia, so that you can do, um, uh, you know, you can tailor it to, you know, the the problem or the class of problems you are trying to solve. So we have worked extremely hard over the last few years to make the Julia language as small as possible, so that innovation can happen on top of this small core. Uh, however, the small core itself is evolving and getting better and, and getting a lot of new features. Uh, we are just releasing Julia 1.5 and you'll see uh, an amazing number of new capabilities coming in there. Um, but then on top of it, you should be able to, so, so let me give you an example. All the GPU capabilities that I just showed, those GPU capabilities are completely implemented outside of Julia in the CUDA.jl package. The GPU compiler is not part of the Julia compiler at all. It's an add-on package. Uh, so, you know, when you, when you install Julia, you can add the CUDA.jl package and that's how the GPU compilation capabilities come on. And uh, this is how I believe that the community, you know, is going to grow and uh, we have a scalable model, right? With the package ecosystem, with the binary builder, with all these things, the model is scalable and we are very, very keen on promoting diversity and inclusion in our community. Uh, we have a very strict community uh, code of conduct and we really try to engage uh, with the community um, and drive uh, a positive uh, you know, tone of discourse um, uh, and a very collaborative one. Um, and, and some of the people you'll see in the community, are, I mean, a lot of them are professors at some of the top universities around the world. A lot of the contributors 
um, you know, are experts in their field who have been doing things for, you know, years and years together, but you'll also see a lot of new talent come in. Oh, I should point out that one of the ways to get involved with Julia is the Google Summer of Code and the Major League Hacking kind of things. If you're a student, that's one way to get, uh, you know, connected to the community and spend a summer uh, doing things and being mentored and then, you know, going ahead and uh, becoming a mentor yourself in the future. Um, what are those resources called? Google Summer of Code and the other one? Um, Major League Hacking, MLH. A lot of these resources are on the uh, are on the community page on the Julia website. Okay, great. Um, so another question from your, our audience is, uh, does Flux use tensor cores in the GPU? Mm -hmm. uh, Flux is, uh, I believe it is able to use tensor cores, but I would not be 100% sure about that. I, I would say that if Chris Rakakis is sure of that answer, you should give it on the next call. But uh, I, believe, I believe the answer is yes now. It was definitely not true about a year and a half ago. Okay, great. Um, and lastly, I wanted to ask you, you showed us uh, some exciting examples of uh, the use of Julia in the field of health. Uh, I wanted to ask you about more examples that you might be able to give us about, I'm sure people contact you all the time saying, I'm using Julia to do this or that. And could you please, um, uh, 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 explain or tell us the story of one particular use case? I think I'm practically out of time on that, but uh, luckily the next talk is going to be exactly that. It's going to be a deep dive into some of the applications that uh, so I would just say stay tuned and it's coming. Okay, great. So we're going to listen to Chris Rakokas uh, after Vidal, thank you very much, Vidal. It was a great talk, and I hope many people are excited about starting to use Julia. And okay, see you there in the Julia universe. Bye. Thank you. 
Hello, Chris. How are you? Very so, good. Pretty good. Yeah. Okay, so our next talk today for our Julia Day, uh, which started with Vidal, uh, now continues with Chris, uh, who is using Julia to research scientific machine learning, focusing on how the randomness from scientific data can be used to uncover the underlying mechanistic structure. He's the lead developer of differential equations.jl and Pumas AI. Uh, so your talk is going to focus on how the language is changing scientific research. Um, so welcome, Chris, and you're welcome to share your screen whenever you're ready. All right, so everyone sees my screen? Yes. All right, so hello, everyone. Um, I'm Chris Rokakis, uh, MIT Mathematics, also a few, a few other things. So um, I'm a senior research analyst in the School of Pharmacy at University of Maryland, uh, uh, Baltimore. And I'm also the, uh, the director of scientific research at Pumas AI, which was mentioned actually in the previous uh, talk. So um, what, what, I'm, what I'm going through today is the composable abstractions that are required to make scientific machine learning a discipline. And so I wanna go through, first of all, you know, what is scientific machine learning and everything. But I, I really wanna showcase how the Julia programming language has given us a tool to be able to really build and compose software in a way that we really haven't before and how, and how that really opens up new opportunities for developers. So a lot of the big machine learning started in Python, right? So, you know, everyone knows about TensorFlow, JAX, and PyTorch, right? So these big machine learning frameworks really started in Python. And so a lot of people think that, you know, there's, there is a advantage that is there in Python, right? So it's been there for a while. They've had these developer resources. They've had Google and Facebook involved. And so does that mean that in the future, machine learning will be happening in Python, right? And that's one of the questions that Vero was given, right? What, 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 is, what is the future of our discipline? disciplines, what is the future of development in software and machine learning? And it might seem like, well, if Python was in the past, and so therefore there's a lot of Python packages, um, that might mean that Python is the future. But what I really want to make a case for is that's not the case. It's not as clear cut as you might think it is. Um, and one thing, way to be able to kind of see that that might be what's going on, or might be an issue, is Swift for TensorFlow. Right, so Google did abandon Python as the main platform they'd be looking at for TensorFlow. And when Google wrote down this down, right, they said Google's wife, you know, they wrote this down. You can search why Swift for TensorFlow. They have this whole article that describes in the final section, right, like how did they make their decision? They said in the end, it narrowed down to the technical merits of Rust, C, Swift, and Julia, right? So Rust and C were. Um, were discarded be, uh, due to usability concerns. Essentially, most people don't want to, you know, have a language where you have to, you know, you have to have a different compilation step and, you know, make files and all, all these extra issues are things that they see that, you know, scientists don't want to have to handle, right? And that's one of the reasons why these interactive languages like Python became very popular. Um, and where what what they what they ended up with was saying that they're going to go with Swift because of implementation details and they because they they knew the internal compiler right but the other thing on the list is Julia 
And so I, what I really want to showcase is, you know, how we have been able to get the, to essentially be, have a competitor to, you know, Google's brand new Swift for TensorFlow, just with a community of just handfuls of people just developing these compiler tools. Right. And one of the reasons why they went with Swift is because Swift has a larger community of app developers. But what I'm going to be talking about today is specifically machine learning for science, right? So scientific machine learning. And there's a lot that we can benefit as scientists use, using Julia because Julia has such a large scientific community already. So what is scientific machine learning? So scientific machine learning is a core component of artificial intelligence and a computational technology that can be trained with scientific data to augment or, or automate human skills, right? That's the definition that the US Department of Energy gave when this, when this term was coined. And what it really means is that, you know, science has so much information in it that what, there are two things that we need to do. One thing that we need to do is we need to utilize everything that we know about science to make AI better. But the other thing that we need to do is, you know, if we everyone help, everyone gets better when science advances. So how do we help the scientist work faster, right? What is the machine learning for the scientist so that way we can discover new physics and so that way we can, you know, accelerate our computations so that way we can uh, even create uh, run climate models in a way that is, you know, more energy efficient, right? How do we do all this with the amazing capabilities of artificial intelligence that have been developed over the last few years. So my claim is going to be that Julia's composable abstractions override any of these historical adv uh, advantages that Python or R, some of these older languages might have for scientific machine learning. Right? There, I'm going to show you how there's some very, there's the ways that things have to interplay to be able to build a, a fully working scientific uh, computing ecosystem that is composable with machine learning libraries is going to have an advantage for Julia over even things that have had libraries built in the past. Now, why would that be the case? So basically where to start is to see that, you know, traditional deep learning learns everything from big data. Right, so the way that you normally think about um, AI is you go, okay, there's, there's, I have my sets of billions of images. You know, I have every single image of dogs on the internet is billions and billions and billions of them. I'm gonna just run this through my neural networks and I'm going to run this training mechanism. And if I train on enough data, this thing will work well. Well, that form of deep learning works really great for some problems, right? It works really great for learning language translation because there's just so much on the internet. It works great for some problems like image processing because there's just so many images on the internet. Now think about something like CERN though, right? The, the Large Hadron Collider was able to run a bunch of experiments, but doesn't, couldn't run millions of experiments, can't run billions of experiments. You know, you can't get that data to be able to train a gigantic neural network just by running the LHC as much as possible because it already costs billions, you know, what was it like $35 billion to be able to build that, the thing to be able to run as many experiments as it did. And so you can't just scale up your data generation for science. You know, you, you can't just build 10,000 Hubble telescopes be kept to be able to feed this data mechanism um, that traditional deep learning has been, right? So I'm, I'm calling it traditional deep learning because we're already 10 years since, uh, since ImageNet, right? So this has been now the way of the past. This is, we, we now need to start looking at problems where we can't just throw more data at the problem, right? And these problems where you can't throw more data at the problem is this big science. It's this expensive world where we can get 30 experiments and we need to learn how everything works from that. And how do we change the way that we're doing artificial intelligence so that way we can make use of it in this discipline, which you know is required for climate modeling, for pharmacology, and all these areas where you, know, you, you can't just run, you, you can't run a clinical trial uh, to be able to get training data on a million people before you know whether a drug is gonna work, right? So how do you do this? And so what we really need to do is we need to not have the machine learning mechanism learn everything, right? It, it can't learn everything from data. We need to find some way to be able to put scientific knowledge into our machine learning. And what, what might that look like, right? So first let's try to figure out what scientific knowledge actually is so that way we can then change around our machine learning framework. So scientific knowledge is physical laws, right? So you can cite things like, you know, Einstein's equations or approximation of that being Newton's equations, right? You can 
there's all these laws that we know about for how different biological organisms work. We know that protein X binds with protein Y. We know the canonical wind pathways. We know a lot of information about different scientific processes. And this is what we have, right? We, we all this scientific knowledge is in, you know, these laws that we know, like the, the ideal gas law works, right? It's an approximation, but you know, that works as approximately to, you know, and as you get further and further in physics classes, you just learn more and more of these laws. And this is what we need to populate our artificial intelligence to start with. And the scientific knowledge, it, you know, it's not the way that you represent these laws is through models, right? So you have these models of how, you know, the climate works, models of how weather works. We have all these models of how, you know, on, on the right, I even show a biological signaling network. So, you know, we know a lot about how oh, the wind signal binds to the fizzle, which binds to beta care. You know, you, we have people have really mapped out how so many different scientific processes work. And these models for what is connecting to what, what never connects to each other, which chemicals interact, which chemicals can't interact, they, all these models for how different processes work is our combination of our scientific knowledge. And now the way that models become something that is predictive, right? The, the hard part in science is bringing these scientific models to mathematical equations. So you might know things like, you know, fluid dynamics or these physical phenomena are written down in terms of things like partial differential equations, where you can, you, you can know that, you know, this term is diffusion, this term is advection. So if I have, you know, I know that I can't lose mass when I'm um, as, a, as a river's flowing. And so there has to be mass conservation laws inside of my equations. And you can prove that you need certain terms here and there and here and there. And then once you have these mathematical equations, you can sit down, you can write a computer that simulates them. And this gives us, you know, all these climate models. This gives us all of our pharmacology models. You might not know as much about biological modeling. So um, there's a lot of biological modeling, biopharma, biopharmacological modeling, uh, like it's shown on the top right, where it's um, the, these these equations are how the chemical reactions within biological organisms uh, interact, right? So you can take images of these, so you can tag things with GFP, like I show here, to be able to see which proteins localize and which ones don't localize. And so after hundreds of experiments that people do, like they gather all these images and you can put it together and you can find out, you know, this protein binds with this one, this one binds with this one, you know, so these things are interacting, these are not interacting. And you can build up these equations that are, are mimicking the chemical reactions within a bi biological organism. And then you can start to ask questions like if I was to reduce the rate of this reaction, you know, how would the brain develop differently? Would I be able to, you know, uh, would I be able to remove Alzheimer's without increasing with someone's blood pressure? All these things are now being able to be assessed by these equations that we're able to pull from thousands and thousands of experiments of, you know, taking these random pictures of different pieces of, you know, zebra fish brains and really pull this knowledge together. Right, so scientific knowledge, when we boil it down, has become all about these mathematical equations, right? Which is why, you know, someone like me in a mathematics department is looking at science through this lens. Now, machine learning, right? I, I mentioned that machine learning means billions and billions of data sets. And the interesting thing about science is that, you know, it, we don't have thousands of data sets. Machine learning runs on data, but what we have in science is a model and that itself is thousands of data sets, right? I, I, can't, I can't point to a single data set that I know of that proves that gravity is true. But you know that gravity exists and you know that you, there's an inverse square law and you know that you know, Einstein's relations hold. And why do we know this, right? We know this from observations of, um, observations of the orbit of Mercury, right? We know the, from the observations of our own solar system. We know it from the observations of galaxies, right? We know so many different little tiny experiments, like thousands and thousands of data sets build together this knowledge that we now know of as the gravitational laws that we can write down the equations for. So we don't have the data that we can feed into a neural network. We don't have, you know, a billion images or a billion rows that are all exactly the same, you know, with the same number of pixels and everything that's the strict requirements to be able to feed to neural networks. But what we do have is we do have an equation that is essentially the proxy for the thousands of experiments that allowed us to know that that equation is true. And so what we need to do is we need to utilize those mathematical equations as our basis to be able to do a machine learning with less or almost no data, right? So those scientific equations has to be what we're, what we're utilizing. 
And so can, how can we incorporate scientific models as prior knowledge into AI? Well, this is the act of scientific machine learning by utilizing these mathematical models as a form of data, as a form of prior knowledge. So in order to understand a little bit about why this works, right? So I'm not gonna, this is not gonna be like a very technical talk. I'm just going to, you know, kind of give a, a high level overview of how scientific machine learning works to be able to then start to focus on the software aspects of it. Um, but what I do want to understand or make sure everyone understands is why does machine learning work and just enough to be able to understand how we can then augment it with science. So let's take one step back and just ask the question, why is machine learning working in the first place? So these prediction algorithms like neural networks are actually just functions, right? A neural network is just something that takes in, you know, if it has an in input layer of three, that just means it takes three, three input numbers and it spits out two numbers. Right. If it's an image, it's going to be giving, you know, if it has like a yes, no for cat or dog, you know, then it's going to be giving you like a Boolean. Yes, this is a cat. No, this is not a cat. Yes, this is a dog. No, this is not a cat dog. Right. In reality, all of that's really going on is it's something that takes in a whole bunch of numbers and it spits out a whole bunch of numbers. And so it's just a function, right? It's any function like you would have written down in a mathematics course when, you know, when you're in your fourth grade. And what you do with machine learning is you really just figure out there's just a bunch of little knobs in there. And you just have to figure out what, how to push these knobs around such that the inputs give you the outputs that you were expecting. That's really all that, the, that a neural network is. It is a function that has enough knobs in there. And the universal approximation theorem, right? This fancy thing that people have been able to prove is just that a neural network with enough layers, so, you know, deep enough, large enough, is able to approximate any function. So if you have a big enough neural network and if you have enough data, you can have that neural network do, uh, do any input to output behavior that you want. And so if you feed it, you know, if you use a really large neural network and you feed it a billion different images, you can make it so that way image one, it says dog, image one, image two says cat, image three says dog, right? And all you have to do is you have to just choose all the little knobs in there to be perfectly correct. And, you, and it will give you that output. And what this universal approximation theorem gives you is it says there exists a way to be able to tweak the knob such that that will be true, right? So this is really the key to machine learning. The fact that a neural network is something that is a universal function approximator. A neural network is something that can have any possible input output behavior. And that's why it's been so useful for data science. And so we can start to, if we understand machine learning from that standpoint, we can start to see how we can use it inside of physical equations, right? Because for example, in the Navier-Stokes equations I had written down here, there was an external force. And you might ask, well, what, what is the external force? Well, you know, if you're in a climate model, that external forcing could be due to things like uh, CO2 entering the, you know, uh, entering the atmosphere. It can be due to you know, injecting something into a biological system. These, there are external forces that can happen and you might not actually know what that function is. You might not know all the terms of your equation. Another thing that can happen is you have an approximate model, right? Your, your model might not be, have all the details in there, like it's seen in you know, these epidemiological models for how COVID-19 is, is, is spreading. You know, if your model's incorrect, then there are some functions you might be missing. And you can always kind of figure out what those missing functions are. You can represent them with neural networks. So now you don't have, you know, you don't have a world of AI, which is doing image processing and in a world of science where you know gravity, right? Now you have gravity with missing terms like dark energy, where those can be represented and discovered with neural networks. And this is really what we're getting to with scientific machine learning. So this right here is the universal differential equation, which is augmenting these scientific models, these differential equations with universal pro function approximators. And this, this technique, it seems to be very powerful, right? It's only been going on for you know, about a year now. But we've, what we've been able to see, for example, is and colleagues of mine showed that you can, you, know, you can take a state-of-the-art battery model. So one that's able to uh, figure out how, what the degradation is like of, of, um, of batteries. And you can take that, you can augment it with neural networks, you can use the, this on data. And then once you train the, these missing terms of your model, you can recover some missing chemical properties, some missing you know, unknown physics about how this battery is working and increase your prediction accuracy uh, by 19%. And what they're actually using this then for mm -hmm. is to be able to do battery powered cars and battery powered airplanes, right? So these fancy things like Teslas, you know, these things are going to be advanced by using scientific machine learning, you know, this, this connection 
connection between neural networks and scientific models slashed all, uh, smashed all together. And another thing that we're seeing is, you know, we, we can actually discover entirely new forms of physics. Like we can get rid of a physicist having to spend years and years of research by utilizing this technique. And so one of my students was actually looking at this problem of, you know, droplet physics. So you, basically this, this, the problem is, you know, when you, when you have a droplet, how exactly do things spread, right? This, this is really good to know for something like COVID-19 where, you know, these droplets are causing, you know, spread of moisture that could essentially be in, um, that could cause infections. So all these properties of like what, whether a math should work or not comes down to whether we know how droplet physics works. And surprisingly, this is not something that we know too much information about right now. And so what, what the student was doing was he was looking at, can we predict you know, these droplet crowns? Can we to predict what, how the, what the different mass distribution is? Can we predict these different properties to understand how these droplets would, would move? And the, the real problem was that you know, there's one term in there that we didn't actually know, right? There, there's this crown height, which is, you know, we, we can measure a few things, but we can't actually get this crown thickness. But can we use some data to be able to figure out what this missing physics is? And if we can figure out these missing physical equations, then we can understand how to be able to utilize what, you know, the new physics of droplets to be able to develop you know, better masks. And so we can replace that, that missing term with the neural network and start to ask, if we were to put AI specifically into our physics here, can we then learn and recover you know, the missing physics and start to figure out what the equation should have been without having to derive theory. And so what was done was, you know, this, this technique, which we call the universal differential equation, was used to train for this missing term. And in just one weekend, we're able to figure out, hey, this, you know, it was able to figure out that this term should have been this, this squared law. So it's this law of, you know, T to the three fifths over S squared. I'm gonna not gonna mention what all these terms are because, you know, the, the, the actual physical equations are, are quite, you know, in depth, but really what, what it was able to do is able to find out that for the, if I make this neural network be, become the correct term in here, once it learns to be the correct term, then that correct term must be this physical law like here. And now you might mention, you might notice that, you know, the neural network is actually incorrect here, but the neural network was not incorrect here. Instead, what was incorrect was the theory. The theory, in order to actually do the derivation, our, the, what, what Raj had to do was he had to make a few assumptions, you know, what happens when S is very, very small. And so the, those assumptions that were true when S is around one. And what, what this actually finds out is the neural network learns what the correct theory should be in, in the place where the, th where the theory was derived for, but then in the place where we can get measurements of the true droplet physics beyond where the theory is supposed to be predicting, then the neural network was able to predict a new theory, which we still don't know how to derive. And so, you know, this student was able to, you know, this, this really smart MIT student was able to essentially redo his two years of work in one weekend because he could take the equations that people knew, replace that missing term that he took two years deriving, um, and then just discover it with the neural network. And that's really the key behind what, what's going on here, right? Mixing the two is now allowing very, you know, these physicists to be able to accelerate the way that they're working. And that itself means that we're accelerating the scientific discovery process. And so scientific machine learning can be used to learn missing physics, right? It can be, learned, be used to learn physics that we did not know about. But another way it's being used is it can approximate physics. It can find new ways to be able to speed up our computations by giving us cheaper ways to be able to simulate because we can have smaller models just be as, as accurate as the large one, as the full model. And one place where this is being used is in climate parameterizations. So climate models, you know, their, their starting point is this fluid dynamic uh, equation, which is this Navier-Stokes, this really large partial differential equation. And it's pretty much impossible to solve, you know, the Navier-Stokes on the, on the full earth. So no one even tries to do that. Instead, what people do is you try to you do these theoretical derivations where you say, you know, well, you know, if, if, you know, water doesn't really condense. So, you know, I make an assumption here, you know, if I assume that the temperature of the earth is always around 25 degrees Celsius. And if I assume, you know, you know, the gravity is the same all around the, you make a bunch of assumptions. And then you say, under these assumptions, then the, the temperature in the, in the z-axis going up and down on the ocean can be written down by this much simpler equation. And then this is the equation that people actually utilize in the climate model. 
and it works quite well. Um, but there are a lot of inaccuracies that we know about that are introduced by this approximation process. And so there's, and there's actually, if you ask you know, a climate scientist about these equations, they can actually point to it and say, this term right here is the term that we have the most uncertainty from. Well, why not make, you know, if, if the, we know that this function, this one right here is incorrect, what happens if we replace that term with a neural network? and train that on the data that we have, right? Then it'll be something that will be, it will utilize all the knowledge of our theory, all the, uh, all the simplifications that we know we can do, but then it allows for a fudge term to say, you know, we know that we've, we've missed something, please neural network, please fix, you know, use this as your starting point and fix that final part of the equation for me. And this is what we're seeing gives you not only accelerated simulations, right? If we're not just using the accelerated form, but now we're able to make that accelerated form a lot more accurate. And this is how we're getting to this new generation of climate models, like we're seeing built purely in Julia. Um, this, this Caltech and MIT is in this collaboration. And what we're really building it towards something that we can have much more quantified uncertainties and accelerated through this, this you know, connection between artificial intelligence and scientific modeling. And so if you want to find a, a lot more details about how you would do this, you know, if, if you're interested in the mathematics and the science and the computation there, I have a few talks, very recent on YouTube, and they all go into explicit, in, you know, they go, go into detail. In fact, one of them is a four-hour workshop about how you, how you actually program these things, uh, full live coding. So if you want to know all the details about how to do this, um, go check out the workshop. But what I want to do instead is I want to really describe how the, the software was actually built. I want to, you know, dev to dev, I want to give you a talk about why this was built in Julia instead of trying to do this in Python. And I will say right now, I could not have done this in Python. So for these techniques to work, scientific simulation and machine learning need to talk the same language. Right, you can't have TensorFlow works over here, and you can't have Python works over here, and you know, and one person does something and then another person's working in TensorFlow. Now we're talking about this problem where the climate model actually needs to have the neural network inside of it. Now we're talking about this problem where the pharmacological model or the biosimulator needs to have neural networks in there. So they need to be in, in speaking the same language. It needs to all work together, right? And you might think that might work in, uh, directly in Python, but here's the issue, right? The, the real issue is that TensorFlow is not Python. It looks a lot like Python. You program TensorFlow inside of Python, but TensorFlow is not Python, right? So when you look at TensorFlow variables, it says tf.variable, right? So whenever you see that, you should know that you're defining a TensorFlow variable, which is not a Python variable, right? You're, you're defining TensorFlow constants, which are not, which are not Python constants. You're, you're, you're evaluating in, in the TensorFlow graph which is not the tensor, which is not the Python language, right? And so you can't just take an existing, you know, if you look at a Python code and you look, if you had a full climate model written in Python, that is not a TensorFlow code. So you cannot put a, a TensorFlow neural network in there. They are two completely different things because they're, it's not the same language, right? So TensorFlow is a language that you program from Python, but it is not Python itself. And so you cannot take an existing scientific code and just throw a neural network in there and expect TensorFlow to work on it. That means that we might have, if we want to use TensorFlow, we need to rewrite all of our simulators, you know, things that people have been working on for 20 years into TensorFlow. And PyTorch is also not Python. So PyTorch gets pretty close, but there's a lot of cases where you can point at, you know, there's a, when, when people are taught PyTorch, right? They're taught all of these very interesting details about where everything is different. Right, so um, for example, transpose has different syntax between the two. Sometimes they match the same syntax, right? So a, 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 a numpy array.sum has the same syntax as a tensor.sum from PyTorch, but they actually don't compute the same thing, right? They, they're, they're computing the sum differently. And if you know that your, your, your floating point operations are not um, associative, you'll get, a different, uh, num, you'll get a different answer from the sum in numpy than PyTorch and your, your errors will be different. Um, sometimes when you, you know, some of these values, you know, you might have a sum, well, the sum in NumPy will turn a return of number, whereas a, a, a sum in PyTorch will return a one by one array, right? So there, there's all these semantic differences. And so if you try to put a, ten, a PyTorch neural network inside of an existing Python code, you know, even if it's using things like NumPy, very standard tools, it won't just work. And in fact, it not only will it not just work, but PyTorch doesn't even implement the full NumPy. 
right? There are, there are some operations like determinant which are not natively supported yet. So it's not the same, like it, it's close, but it's not the same language. And it means that anytime that you want to be able to take a scientific code and be able to use neural networks inside of it, you need to rewrite it, right? You, you basically need to start from scratch. And so the, if we're thinking about scientific machine learning, this connection, we really can only use the codes which are already pre-built to be able to utilize neural networks inside of them, which is not the millions of packages in the scientific ecosystem. It's the very few packages that people have written for, for, for TensorFlow or PyTorch. And it's the even smaller bit of them, which are were not for machine learning, but for scientific uh, models instead. And so the difference is, can be subtle, right? It, it can be a matter of correctness and performance. Right, so they the, Python is an imperative language. TensorFlow is a de declarative language. So they have different language semantics. Um, in one, you can control memory representations. In another, it takes it for you and it distributes things for you. And you know, the sums can be in different orders so they can compute different values. This is something that it, you have to be very careful about. So you can't just take an existing code, expect this to happen because they are, you know, if, if you put the numbers in there, you'll see that you get different values. And if you try to just slam things together, you'll get these compiler errors. And so this is, this is really a key, key issue. If you can't just reuse your existing package, then we're losing one of the, the main things that we had before with Python, right? And so one, one of Python's advantages was its packages. But if you can't just take someone's existing work and throw a neural network on there, then we lose one of those main advantages. And when, what we need to start asking then is, where can we have someone who is working on the scientific model build a scientific model and have me come on along and put a neural network inside of there without ever having to communicate, right? Because we want to be able to reuse each other's work. We want to be able to, you know, have just one ecosystem where we can start to be able to, you know, have people modeling and people doing artificial intelligence and slam things together and not have to worry about rewriting other people's code bases. And so because we can't just reuse all these Python, this old Python software, I think it gives us a good reason to reevaluate our choice of language, right? We, we, if, we, if, we, if some people are gonna have to start from scratch anyways, what is the least from scratch we can do or what is the most advantage we can get um, in, this, in this area? And so one option that you can go with is you can create a domain specific language, right? So a domain specific language is something like here, uh, here Diftachi is a, is a really great one. It is, a, it is a differentiable programming language for physical simulation. So they're, they're writing a, a language which has a semantics very similar to, Py, uh, to Python um, that compiles in specific ways, right? So they wrote their own, uh, they, they matched, they got pretty close to Python in the syntax. They wrote their own compiler. And if, you, if, you're, if your problem fits into their, their system, then it is, you know, it can work pretty well. And you can do a lot of physical simulations with you know, differentiable programming, which is required for neural networks in there. You can do a lot of that with, uh, with Diftachi on the, on the types of problems they've demonstrated. So you have full control if you want to have a domain specific language. But if you have a domain specific language, that means you have to write everything yourself, right? So you can have your domain specific language for robotics and you can have your language for uh, geosciences. You can have your language for biosciences. And then everyone can just rewrite full compilers from scratch. Everyone can just rewrite, you know, every single library for linear algebra from scratch. And, you know, you, you could probably see that, you know, that, that, that has its own advantages, but it doesn't it doesn't really solve the problem that I'm looking at, right? It doesn't solve this problem of, I just wanna reuse people's software in a, in a way to do scientific machine learning and going to you know, these sub domain specific languages doesn't really capture that, that difficulty. It doesn't really solve that problem. And so can we make a language that, with, that doesn't have a barrier between the way it does machine learning and the way that other software works, right? That language exists and it's called Julia and there's already thousands of scientific simulators you can use with machine learning. And this is, this is really why uh, Julia is, comes into the play. So, you know, why is Julia, why Julia? What is Julia? So Julia is this language which is very expressive, right? So you can take a textbook algorithm, you can implement it in Julia that utilizes the same symbols as all of the textbook algorithm, right? You can look almost exactly like what, what you would find when you, when you learn the problem. 
And then you can have your simulator work in a way that looks a lot like the mathematics. And so this, for example, um, is looking at a Gillespie simulation. These are things that we use inside of um, the quantitative systems pharmacology for model informed um, drug development and, and these other in these other aspects. Right. So th this is real model code that looks almost exactly like the mathematical model, which makes it easy for a mathematician to just kind of play around with it and modify it. So this is one of the reasons why people have used Julia. And one of the other main reasons why people have used Julia is because it's fast. Right. I don't mean it's just a little fast. I mean that it's able to essentially get to what uh, C++ is able to do. Right. And, and so what, what we see in this case is that, you know, you can you can use a, a path. If you were to write this whole Gillespie simulation yourself in R, it can take 785 milliseconds. If you use, utilize one of the R packages, it can take 463 uh, milliseconds. If you utilize differential equations at JL, you get down to one millisecond. That package is completely written in Julia. All right, so and so you, and you can actually sit down and say for this exact problem, I'm not going to use the package. I'm going to I'm going to optimize exactly the, the simulation code for this problem, and you can get this down to 0 0.5 seconds, so 650 times faster than R. This is using an interactive language, right? This is interactive, like Python or R, but you're getting these humongous speed ups with syntax and style that looks like the, the actual math. And this is one of the main reasons why people had adopted Julia in the past. And one of these other advantages then is because Julia is fast enough and is very expressive, you have these entire packages, like I mentioned, differential equations.jl. Flux.jl is another one that, which is written entirely in Julia, right? So you have this 100% um, on, on the GitHub that says, oh, this is, this is a Julia package, right? It can be hard sometimes to actually figure out what's a Python package, because if you look at you know, TensorFlow on, on, on GitHub, you'll see that it is you know, mostly not Python code. Um, even PyTorch, even though it is, you know, it, it's, its largest amount is Python code, it's still majority not Python code, right? And this means that you, you have a lot of issues getting and keeping developers, right? So, um, right, so one, of, one of these other reasons for why Julia is that it's easier to get to people developing because if you know how to use the language, then you know how to develop for the language. So uh, what people talk about in this space is the truck factor, right? Um, it's how many people would have to get hit by a truck such that the the um, the project would stop, and it's you know if if you aren't in the open source community, the numbers are a lot smaller than you think it might be, right? So for example, something like pandas um, has essentially two developers at a time. It's, it had one developer that uh, another developer who used to be working on it that doesn't work on it as much, and has had a new one then kind of join in as well. But it has a you know it has a truck factor of two. So if if you lost those two people, the, the project is done. Um, TensorFlow, it, according to to these resources uh, that have measured the truck factors, has two people essentially were, uh, who know the software well enough to be able to really keep the whole thing running. Um, that these truck factors tend to be quite low and they, they're especially low in languages where the way that people build packages is not by writing in the same language, but writing in a separate language, right? So TensorFlow is implemented mostly in C++. So most of the people who use TensorFlow wouldn't know how to develop it because it is in a different language than the one that they've learned. If you look at the truck factors for Julia packages or even the Julia programming language itself, right? So languages are hard to write, compilers are hard to write, but even then it has a truck factor that is a lot larger than a lot of widely used Julia packages or than a lot of Python packages simply because it is written mostly in Julia. And so if you know how to write Julia, you know, if you can write fast Julia code, which, hey, Julia is fast by default, then you know how to write Julia packages and you know how to write Julia itself because it is something that is written in Julia, right? So, so why, why Julia? Well, you, having everything in one language is really about productivity, building a larger developer base. And this is actually one of the advantages that we're able to get. And it's why Julia is growing so fast, right? Because everyone who uses the language can also be a, a package developer. And now the key then that gets us to scientific machine learning is this last one. And it's that Julia is composable, right? So. Here, what I'm showing is there's an ODE library, you know, differential equations defines ordinary differential equations. And then there's a neural network library, Flux. And so now we want to put neural networks inside of differential equations. What we do is we define a neural network with the neural network library. We define an ODE, an, uh, an ordinary differential equation with the differential equation library. And we just put the two together and it works. Right, so so you you probably might have heard about you know this 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 uh, very cool new ma uh, machine learning uh, um, methodology called neural ODEs, right? That came out just a few years ago. 
the neural ODE library in Julia is just the network neural network library and the ODE library used at the same time. And so, you know, if we, there's a lot of things that are modeled through ODEs. There's combustion modeling, you know, that, that is done with uh, differential equations. Well, that uses differential equations such yellow, it uses this package. You know, pharmacometric modeling um, and, and modeling of quantitative system pharmacology that uses differential equations such yellow. Climate models use differential equations such yellow. Robotics models use differential equations such yellow. All these things are using this one package which is already able to be used with neural networks. And so that whole thing that I just mentioned about, hey, we might wanna stick the two together. You don't actually have to write new code to do this. If someone has already written quantum dynamics with simulations, if someone's already written battery simulations, then you could just take that battery simulation, plug a neural network into there. And because of the composability of Julia, now you have a battery, you know, now you have a battery model, which is integrating neural networks to be able to do state-of-the-art scientific machine learning. This is something that we're talking about five lines of code, 10 lines of code to be able to start doing these state-of-the-art investigations um, just by putting two things together, right? That's what composability means. It means take A, take B, now you have A plus B. Putting things together is actually a very strong part of the Julia programming language. And when composability goes long or wrong, you lose the advantage of high level languages in package ecosystems, right? So Python has had a lot of really good work done to it, but when you don't have this composability, then you lose a lot of that advantage. So for example, um, if, you, if you look at something like a differential equations not jail, right? So what composability lets you do is you can take this differential equation library and utilize it with neural networks in a way that someone does not have to rewrite a new differential equation library in PyTorch, right? Why, why, would, why would you want to do that? Well, because dense, dif differential equations not jail, we've optimized it for many, many years now with people who, whose expertise is actually in just solving this exact equation, right? There are people who, who like me, who have studied for years and years and years just how to solve this equation very, very fast. And so we've been able to show that we can get, you know, 50 times faster than SciPy, 50 times faster than MATLAB, 100 times faster than uh, D and then RSD solve library. And these are actually calling Fortran uh, code underneath the hood too, All right? So, so th there's a lot of very deep si uh, mathematics and science that you can do to make these differential equation solvers really fast. And we don't need to have to try to replicate it in a, new, in a new framework, in a new machine learning framework every few years, right? Because we've been able to just write this library, be able to optimize this library, and be able to really hyper-optimize this library and utilize the neural network inside of there without having to rewrite it. So composability lets an, an expert work on their expertise, let someone else work on their expertise, and now A plus B works together, and now you get the, the, you get the sum of the parts, it, or, it, which is essentially is more than the sum of the parts, because you get the speed of the two people um, having optimized their, their scientific domain. And so what we've actually seen with this is that, you know, the, when the neurology paper came out in, with PyTorch, right, this, this is uh, 2019, there was a lot of these extra features that we have in these differential equation libraries, like solving stiff equations, handling, of, handling discontinuous events, all these extra features weren't there, right, because they had to write a, a new one from scratch in PyTorch. And that one that they wrote in PyTorch, it wasn't as optimized as the Fortran code that people have been working on for years, because it was one developer who, you know, was working on this to try, try to get this paper done. And, you know, it was 450 times slower than SciPy on this example that we show here. And that means that it was 30,000 times uh, slower than, than uh, Julia, right? So th this, is, this is not a small difference. You know, compo what composability lets us do is we can take this heavily optimized code. And if you don't use this heavily optimized code, then you're either trying to redo this from scratch or you're taking some shortcuts. So that way it's not fully optimized. And this, this, this difference can, can grow even as the subject expertise that's required grows, right? So we get into a more obscure topic, you know, stochastic differential equations. So there's this Torch SDE that came out um, just actually just a few weeks ago where, you know, they, they've written a stochastic differential equation solver, which is kind of a niche uh, field of differential equations. And if you take the README, you take the README example, and you take the, the documentation example in Julia, you'll see that the README example was 76,000 times slower than the, than the package in Julia. But the, the, the new one is able, you know, Torch SDE can, works with PyTorch, so that's the advantage. Um, but the, the Julia one also works with neural networks because no one even had to make it work with neural networks to, 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 for that to work, right? And, and so this composability is, is this huge strength. 
Actually, this one is kind of interesting as well because right before this talk, um, the the uh, the authors of this Torch SD library told me that they've actually improved the benchmarks. Right, so it no longer takes a thousand seconds for the for the um, for Torch SD to run these this example. It now it goes to five seconds. And so you know these these uh, Google engineers have now been working for weeks to get to a point where it it is essentially running a whole bunch of highly optimized C plus code to be only five hundred times slower than the Julia library. Whereas this Julia library for, for solving these stochastic differential equations is something that I wrote in 2016 as part of a PhD project. And it just exists as something that is fast because it's in Julia. And it just exists as something that I can use in neural networks because of this composability. So, I mean, th this, is, this is a huge comparative advantage for me as like a mathematician scientist, you know, to just be able to reuse these old codes in a way that is still optimized. And so, the other thing that's going on, right, is, you know, you, you might have noticed that in, in Python, you don't just have one machine learning framework, you have new ones coming out all the time, right? So, you know, you, you, some of us remember Theanos, and Theanos went to, to TensorFlow, and then TensorFlow went to PyTorch, and now some people are talking about JAX, right? And so, if you want to do machine learning inside of neural networks, or neural networks inside of differential equations, well, now you're going to have to rewrite a new one in JAX, right? And so, how's that going along? Well, you know, there's a PhD student at Northeastern just 19 days ago who implement who tried to implement a version of one of these uh, stiff ODE solvers. And where they're at right now is they're about 200 times slower than uh, VODE when you're utilizing the JIT compiler from uh, JAX against just the Python code, right? So 200 times slower than SciPy. But remember, like our library was already in Julia was already 50 times faster than SciPy. So we're talking about you know thousand you know three orders of magnitude um, difference here. And you, you know, so this student is just trying to do some work in, try, in trying to get into this discipline of scientific machine learning. And to get there, he needs to start from scratch and write these differential equation solvers into these machine learning libraries. And there's just this huge burden of having to rewrite so much software to even just be able to get to their research. And so, you know, in, in, every time a new machine learning framework comes out, this work needs to be redone. And that's, that's the cost of non-composability. And so composability, really just means that we're accruing developer time and resources, right? So the differential equation library in Julia that we're now using for, you know, this, this scientific machine learning and, and you know, this, these, these, uh, this research, it started in 2016. We're still using the same code from there. You know, the, these new, you know, you, you think of Python as having these packages since forever, but these packages that are doing these, this neural network infused uh, differential equations, they're from 2019, the, the code's from 2020. You know, we've had over 50 developers that have highly optimized different aspects of our code, whereas these are just brand new pieces of code put out by one people or, you know, like one lab, you know, like a PhD student advisor and maybe like a trainee student, right? And what, what do the developer practices mean? Well, we've been able to, to develop, you know, this, this continuous integration system, where if you look at our SciML ecosystem, we have hundreds of hours of continuous integration that would be run if you're to change different aspects of uh, this ecosystem. A lot of these actually don't even have continuous integration set up yet because they're, they're brand new, right? They're, 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 these, these are things that are, are not really matured yet. Um, and so a lot of them are even missing things that you might want, like Windows support, right? Like, does it work on Windows? And some of these libraries don't, right? Even the whole JAX machine learning library doesn't work on Windows yet. So, you know, all this stuff that takes developer time and resources, every single time you have this new machine learning framework that you want to do scientific machine learning in, you have to start from scratch and get all of those features again. And composability, you know, really lets you build feature support, right? Because you're not one, you're not trying to rebuild the same basic ODE software every single time. You're not trying to redo Windows support in every single new framework. What you do is you, you get that once, you work on the next problem, you work on the next problem, and you build a whole ecosystem of things that solve a much more difficult problem because it, it builds over time. And so there's all these features that we can point at. Like a lot, some of it's technical, so I'm not going to go into all the details here. But things like stiff ODEs and differential algebraic equations, um, and adjoint methods. You know, these these stabilized adjoint methods, right? So there's stabilization, which which is required that you know you can find in these old C++ libraries. We've made sure in the five years of you know almost five years now of uh, SciML development that we've been able to get them in the Julia ones. They're there the in 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 the Python libraries, right? They'll get there. They'll just require that a lot of people put a lot of time and work in to get there. 
right? Um, you know, the parallelism, what can parallelism exist? Can you use a whole cluster of millions of cores? You know, uh, uh, Vera was just talking about how this is something that we have in Julia, right? This form of parallelism. So we make use of it. And some of these machine learning libraries haven't tried to do this with the neural network library, with the neural ODE library yet, because it's just, you know, they haven't gotten to that scale yet. They don't have enough developer resources. And, and a lot of these little, these issues that you'd associate with an immature package ecosystem, which sounds weird, right? Because you think of Python as having a very mature ecosystem, but the, the thing is that you, if you can't reuse all of your existing technology from before because of this lack of composability and you have to keep on starting from scratch, then you do end up with something that is immature in some of these, you know, ecos in some of these aspects because you can't leverage all that work that you've done. And so is this subverting your expectations about the Python ecosystem? Yeah, probably it should be because you, pr you think, you know, Python is very mature in a lot of its aspects and a lot of this, you know, these web development and things like that. But if you can't just take the existing package and use it in this discipline, then you're at step one again. And so composability is really the thing then that allows us to be able to drive forward with Julia because we can use all this code that people have built in the last 10 years of Julia, right? It's only been around for 10 years. So you might say Python's been here longer, but everything that we have built can be used in all of our machine learning frameworks. And so when machine learning for framework five comes around and people are having to rebuild things in Python, once again, we still have, we, we, it just compounds the advantage that we get to have in Julia. And so uh, it's just to, just to take a case study of, of how this is going on, right? So, you know, we're looking at reaction combustion. We're very interested in some of these reaction combustion problems, be able to figure out how to do more efficient jet engine development, right? Uh, one of the things that you can use is catalyst.jl. So catalyst.jl was actually built for biological simulations, but they have its, it's biological simulations are also for chemical reaction system networks. Um, it has been for developers. One of them has been me since 2017. And it, because it uses differential, it, it builds differential equation code, then um, it's compatible with the neural network libraries and it can do Bayesian estimation, sparsity support, neural, and it composes with neural networks, right? Um, there's another one that's come up, a reaction mechanism simulator built by one of these MIT PhD students. He's been working on it for about a year now, or two, two major developers there, and also has Bayesian, uh, Bayesian neural network support and sparsity handling, and you know these stabilized adjoints, because it's just using the tools that exist in the Julia ecosystem and putting its reaction mechanism, its cat reaction combustion um, components on top of it. Right, there, there is a, a library for doing this in, in, in uh, PyTorch, it started in May at three major developers. Those actually, those major developers now have actually started using Julia instead, though. Um, and there's there's one that started in uh, Jax uh, in Jax as well, right? So this Jax Reactor Library. It has one developer, and that developer is actually the same person who I showed earlier put in the in the pull request to be able to add stiff OD support to to Jax. Right, so he essentially he he seems like a, a very great developer. I looked at some of the code, you know, fantastic work. Um, but in order to actually do what he wants to do with Jax, he needs to start from scratch and write everything from the ground up. Whereas what these other developers have been able to do is you just say, hey, look, there's this existing biological simulation library. No one has thought to put a neural network in there. Boom, those things together is a library I can use for this research. And so it's this, this advantage that you can get in, in these scientific disciplines is pretty magnificent once you look at how to do this composability. And composability is really, you know, one of these other things that you get from it is you get a corpus of, you know, documentation, tutorials, uh, teaching resources that builds up over time, right? The, the, the things of a um, mature ecosystem you get from composability because you aren't restarting new libraries every few years. You, you know, so the differential equation library has been around for four and a half years, almost five years now, and there's four online workshops because I've been doing one per year. Right. Um, there's 26 tutorials with, you know, how to for how to find uh, missing physics and do Bayesian estimation. And there's all this stuff for doing automated discovery of phys uh, physical equations that has all been able to build up because we've never had to throw anything away. Instead, what happens is you get new, you know, we got GPU support because someone added GPU support to the Julia programming language and now boom, now we have GPU support. Someone added neural networks to the Julia programming language and boom, now this is all together, right? We've just been able to build on our path and just work on one problem 
And by working on just this one problem, we get something that's able to work on the combination of all problems because other people have been working on those. And so now we, now we actually end up in this, this interesting spot where it's actually kind of hard to document all the things that we can do because you can come up with a combination of something we've never tried. And that, is a, that would be in another language, that would be a new library to write. But in Julia, that's just a documentation example we haven't written down yet. And so there's a lot of scientific machine learning opportunities that are just ready here in Julia, right? So the Klima climate model, uh, we, we, MIT and Caltech has been building it. And our, our next step is just to add neural networks to it. You know, we've been doing pharmacological modeling and robotic simulation. These things are ready to be do new scientific machine learning. We don't just, you can pick them up and start to work with it. Um, and so we, what we, you know, one of the things that we've been working on for now three years is to get this FDA validated pharmacometric software um, that can run really fast. And in the last year, since scientific machine learning has come around, now it's a SIML enhanced one, right? And this is, this is actually something where people are still using Fortran codes. People haven't even gotten to write, really rewriting this kind of software in any other high level uh, programming language. So um, th this is actually a huge area for us to be able to do a lot of interesting research and uh, drug development in that you really won't find anywhere else. And so it also means, so with the differential equation library, right, you, you want to have GPUs working on your neural networks inside your differential equations. And be, this just comes from composability. We didn't actually have to do anything for, for this to work. And so what composability means is that you have the whole language and all of its developers at its, as its tool, right? You, you don't have your camp of, you know, the, the, these people are the packages that I work with, or these, this group is the group that, that is going to work for me. Right, you have anyone who works in parallelism in Julia gives me a new feature. Every single time they, they add one, I have a new feature. So it's, it's actually hard for me to kind of keep up with documentation with all the features that just kind of exist out of composability. And so what we, what we have now is we have this scientific machine learning ecosystem, which a lot of it is, it's the differential equation solvers for doing the scientific modeling. A lot of these modeling toolkits, right, for, for you know, easily doing combustion modeling, easily doing uh, building energy simulations, easily doing robotics. Um, and then the feature, the, these libraries that do scientific machine learning, like DiffEQ Flux and Neural PDE, these, li these libraries, which are now becoming very popular, they actually don't really have much code at all. They're like 200 code, lines of code with a whole bunch of tutorials just showing you how to slap together a bunch of libraries because we need a, put, a place to put the documentation for how to do this thing that exists by itself because Multiple Dispatch has created this feature. And so my conclusion then is that composability is Julia's technical advantage, right? We don't have the, the years and years that, that something like Python or R has, but with scientific machine learning, we need to be able to, to start to compose together software. And once you end up with this problem, then having a historical advantage doesn't really matter anymore. What matters now is how many things are compatible with the code I want to write today. And if, you, if everyone, if the only code that you can work with is code that is written in TensorFlow, or if the only code that you can work with is code written in PyTorch, you now no longer have that advantage in, with Python. And so with the Julia programming ecosystem, you know, we've been able to do things that look absolutely fantastic, right? We, with what looks like less developers than, than Python. It actually isn't much less developers because Julia is written in Julia, right? So we have that advantage that so many people are developing in Julia. You know, a high percentage of people are working in Julia. And then also every single thing that someone else does helps you, you know? So in the end, you don't have to wait for TensorFlow to implement a new, um, a new feature. You don't have to wait for PyTorch to implement a new feature. You don't even have to wait for Julia to implement a new feature. You can change the compiler yourself as a user of building a package in the ecosystem. And then that person who's built a change of feature in the compiler with their package, now you can utilize that in your package. And the two of them together is, is something that to write home about. And so this composability really gives us a, a real technical advantage. And it's been really interesting to work with the Julia programming language because of this, you know, because of the features that we've gotten for free. A lot of times people have messaged me asking me whether a feature exists. And um, sometimes people would message me, like telling me that a feature exists in my library that I did not know about. Um, so yeah, th thank you for having me. I, this should subvert your expectations a little bit, but hopefully understanding this composability at this level makes you really see how new programming language can really push us forward. Thank you uh, for an amazing talk. Uh, there are lots of questions by our audience. Uh, I wanted to start on a personal note. I was really blown away by the from the first minute 
uh, when you made uh, big data seem so small compared with a good model. Uh, nowadays, it seems like every problem is a big data problem. And now I, I, I really changed my mind and I think um, I'm reminded of the quote by Carl Sagan who said, if you want to build, make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. And it seems like you can like uh, plug the entire universe into your, um, into your code and then start computing. And then uh, the data is much uh, richer and uh, just, just big data now seems like uh, it's, it's really nothing at all compared to a good model and some data. Um, well, let, let me, so I think that, you know, there are problems that are solved by big data. And um, actually, I, I like the analogy back to uh, genomics, right? So um, in, in the 1990s, when the Human Genome Project was going through, like Eric Lander was, ran this, this huge project to, to sequence the human genome. And a lot of people were thinking that most major diseases would be solved by knowing the genome. Do you know what was solved? You still can get diseases, right? So that, that didn't happen. What went wrong? Well, the problem is that most diseases aren't due to one gene. Right. There are some diseases where you, you can know, like if you have this, uh, if you have a SNP, if you have a single nucleotide poly polymorphism in this gene, then you'll have Huntington's disease. Right. And so those diseases are the diseases that we're able to target. We're able to build drugs for and you know, we're able to build a lot of nice things for to be able to solve those problems. The diseases which weren't single single gene diseases are the things that we're now working on. Right. In, in some sense, that's what's happening now with AI and machine learning. Right. The problems which were big data machine learning problems, the things like natural language processing and image processing, those are now solved by big data. I'm not, I'm not looking at those, right? But there's so many problems in science where we can't big, get big data. Those are now the problems to look at, right? This is the future of what we want to look at with, with AI and machine learning. We have to change how we're doing this. Great. I'm going to dive into uh, some questions by the audience. Um, one of them, I think uh, it might be uh, a question many have. Uh, which is about um, composability. Like, can you explain a bit more about how it works? Yeah, so essentially the way that this composability works is through, so, so Julia itself, the, way, the reason why it's fast is it has this, this abstract syntax tree, um, which is very simple, right? So it has this abstract syntax tree where it's able to do type inference on. So what, what that means is that it's able to figure out um, and do these computations of if I have this type here, then mm -hmm. I'll have this type here, then I have this type here. And so that was implemented to make Julia fast, right? It was implemented so that way it can have, you can write something a lot like Python, but then it's able to infer what the C code you would have wanted to write was. And the Julia compiler basically has a step of take the Julia code you wrote, automatically augment it with all these type, this type information, and then send it through LLVM, right? So this is why Julia's fast. Well, it, it turns out that if you constrain your language in a way such that type inference works. So Julia does have some features that were, uh, there are basically some things that you can't do in Python or that you can do in Python that you can't do in Julia. For example, you can't, after you define a struct, you can't add new fields to it. Um, because if you could do that, then you would never know what the memory layout of your struct were. Right? There, there are certain features like this that exist in the Python language that make it very hard to reason about. And the Julia programming language is specifically a lot like a high level programming language that you would know from before. And it chooses to not have, allow those features that make it hard to really be able to, to um, do the analysis on and therefore it's able to be fast. But what we found is that if you, by making that decision, right? By making those decisions of, to make it very easy to analyze a program then it makes it easy to do composability in other ways, right? Because if it's easy to analyze a program to make it fast, then it's easy to analyze a program to take it and not compile it for your CPU, but compile it to the GPU. Then it's easy to automatically look at a program and say, this is the program, what is the der derivative version of the program, right? A lot of what these machine learning frameworks are actually doing, like TensorFlow, is it's a separate language from Python because it needed to be a bit simpler to be able to do these, this type of analysis on it. But Julia itself is a full programming language, which is simple enough to be able to do this analysis, but expressive enough to be a high level programming language. And then that's what gives us this composability, that, that simplicity um, that is there for people who want to be able to write compiler optimizations to be able to change other people's code. Great, our next questions are more on the application side. Um, there's a question by Mariana Vignolas, who says she's a fan of your work and she's in the pharmaceutical industry. And her question is, um, do you think that CIML like Pumas uh, will be accepted by FDA and 
or e EMA in new drugs trials and thus shorten the time and money spent in phases one and two? We are testing this out actually. Um, I can't give all the details right now, but we are actually being, we are showcasing that this will work in a real clinical trial. Um, and so there, there's, a, there's a few ways that, that, there's actually more than one project that we're doing that on. So hopefully, you know, hopefully a year or two from now, I'll be able to actually prove that, that this will work in pharmacology by showing you a drug that's been done with this. Amazing. Okay, so next question. Um, Ivan Mindlin says, in your opinion, why aren't we all using SciML? What is the step we need as a scientific technical community to embrace this new approach? And Julia brings a beautiful solution, but is it enough? Yeah, so, um, so why aren't we all using it? It's, I mean, the reason why we aren't using it is because you need all the software for scientific computing, you know, like these full climate models and everything, and you need a full software stack for machine learning. So this is, this is something where we needed to go, as a scientific community, we needed to go through the maturity of, you know, hundreds of years of differential equation solver work. And then the, all, the, all these years recently of deep learning, right? We needed to understand both these disciplines to really know how to use them together effectively and have software ecosystems that can work for it. I think one of the reasons why it hasn't been done, you know, too much in the past is just that it's been software hard to do this, right? So the people who, I mean, the people who demonstrated neural ODs had to write a neural network compatible OD library in PyTorch to be able to do their research, right? Um, and, and so, like, th th there was this, there's this disadvantage where you, you know, it just you had to do a whole lot of work. You had to know enough about numerical differential equations to actually be able to, you know, build the library to be able to solve these equations before you built up the model of those equations before you could even, you know, and then you have to know enough about machine learning. Like, there's just so much you had to know to do it in the past. But now I think we've really hit, you know, we've got the activation energy, we, we've gone over it now. Now we can, you know, we can, I, I teach a course at MIT where we're getting undergraduates to be able to start doing machine, scientific machine learning and be able to get paper worthy, you know, publication worthy results in just a few months. And so now that we're at this level, yeah, now I think that, I, I think that people are just going to start doing a lot more of it. Um, we're just really at the beginning. And is Julia enough for that? Well, there's always a more that you, there's always more that you can add. I think that um, there's more compiler op opportunities that we need to be working with. Um, one of the difficulties with the Julia programming language so far in scientific machine learning is that the spot at which a lot of these composability tools works fairly early. It works before the compiler optimizations. So Julia itself will be, um, will be changing to be able to, to allow for more scientific uh, machine learning tools to be able to be more optimized by allowing us to hit, you know, to hit and modify other people's Julia code after the Julia optimizer has ran. And there's some advantages that we know about that, that we can get from that. And so there are some there are some things that we're, we're working on. I think that the current Julia is able to show quite a quite a quite an amazing amount of, of things. But um, I think that where we'll be in two years will actually be something where we can start to you know really say that scientific machine learning is something everyone should do from the first day they step into undergraduate. Yeah. Thank you. And Vit Obrusnik says. Uh, thinking about uh, control systems uh, like Simulink on MATLAB, uh, he asks if there is any plan to add something like that, something like a more graphical interface to Julia. Yeah, I, I think that the, the question instead, um, I, I'd rephrase it differently, which of these uh, Simulink like libraries in Julia do you want to use, right? Because Julia has a lot of mature uh, libraries. One of the ones that I think is really nice is uh, JUDSL. Um, they, uh, the developer gave a talk at JuliaCon today, so you can go look at their video, you can go look at that package. That's a very nice uh, Simulink-like package. It's only like Simulink because um, it, you know, it has the same ODE part of, of Simulink, but it also adds new features like uh, stochastic so differential equations, delay differential equations, differential algebraic equations, GPU compatibility, these kinds of things that you don't find in Simulink. Um, it's really been what the focus of JUDSL has been to be able to re really extend this form of modeling. Um, uh, another one that I like is a uh, network dynamics.jl. I know that a lot of people at NREL, uh, so some of these national labs for, um, for modeling uh, power grids have been building this up. That's a very nice system for that as well. Um, we've been working on another one. So uh, modeling toolkit.jl is, is essentially a, a modelica like system. So it has simulating like components for um, doing causal modeling, but then it also has, it also allows you to just make equality relationships like in a circuit, just say like, you know, the voltage here equals the voltage here. And so that's called an acausal model. And then it can develop and, and solve the differential algebraic equations from the acausal models. What people haven't been done as much in the Julia ecosystem is really the, the graphic user, graphical user interfaces. Um, 
Simulink has a great G, has a great GUI. Um, what people have been working on right now a lot in Julia is really what are the computational problems that we can solve and how we can make it faster. And so people have just been you know really busy like you know you, you get surprisingly busy just like working on features that you never thought about right. The developers of um, JDSL thought they were going to be building a, a Simulink like system right. So they they did the computational back end. You can do the simulations part of it. They never got around to the GUI because they realized they can start doing stochastic differential equations, which has opened up its own whole, wow, we didn't know we can do these models. And so they've gotten stuck in, in this in this thing of just like working on a lot of the mathematics. I think that us as a Julie community can probably work to add more GUIs to the software that we have. But um, that probably will come as, you know, with commercial enterprises, usually commercial and entities build the GUIs. Yeah. Amazing. And speaking of commercial use, um, what are some applications in the industry? Um, I saw something about the aerospace industry and are, are there more industries that are applying uh, scientific machine learning? Yeah, so there's a lot of stuff going on in aerospace industries, in uh, robotics industries. The one that I know a lot about is pharmacology because um, I'm in, in the pharmacology uh, area. So um, so Pumas AI is this uh, startup that I'm, I'm a part of. I'm the director of scientific research. It started out with um, just building. So uh, for, for the research I was doing to be able to um, do model-informed drug development, I wrote this package in Julia, which was for... Um, which was for building these pharmacological simulations. So nonlinear mixed effects models, pharmacodynamics, pharmacokinetics. Um, and uh, and what, what has happened was we realized that we were able to get speed advantages over some of these old Fortran libraries um, because of this, because of these differential equation solvers that we had, right? That that was really our competitive advantage going in. So we, you know, we now compose, you know, pharmacometrics on top of these differential equation solvers, and we got something that was very, that was very exciting. And in order to um, make it be very useful to the pharmacological com community, we launched a startup around it. So that way we can make sure that we could, you know, get get the funds to be able to do the FDA validation, get this into real pharmaceutical companies. Like, uh, um, can't mention who they are right now. Uh, but you, you might know that there's some uh, very, very there, there's some very there's there's a disease that a lot of people have right now, and there's some vaccines people are wanting to make for it. That you know, it, there, there are some Cambridge companies that are pu very publicly working on on those vaccines, and you know, we 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 have the software now being used to be able to accelerate those processes, right? And so in the pharmacometrics community, we've seen a lot of adoption. Um, so. Uh, I know that in uh, in power grid modeling, that's another industry. Uh, mo more of that is in the national labs, but that still has like a, a very um, uh, strong use. Um, batteries are, are one area that people have been seeing a lot of uh, use cases. And so I demonstrated one where, you know, the scientific machine learning was able to beat the state of the art battery model by about 20%. And that's actually finding uh, customers pretty immediately. We're also, you, you know, so there's so many different areas. It's hard. I can a talk you could do a talk on its own just like an hour long talk just listing off people who are using it in industry so okay uh so besides uh going to juliacon.org and listening to the amazing workshops and talks uh what are some resources our audience can uh, read books or articles or things like that that you recommend yeah so um so yeah, you, you, if you go to julianlang.org, you'll find a lot of resources there, right? You'll find a lot of tutorials, you'll find a lot of blogs that, you know, because there's a, lot, there's a whole blogosphere that's writing about the language and how to use it. Um, but I'd say that the actual best resource is the Julia Slack. All right, so go to slack, uh, slackinvite.julialang.org, get an invite to the Slack, and just start talking to the people there. These people are the people who are building the Julia compiler, they're building the Julia packages, I'm there. Um, you know, so a lot of people who are working on the Julia programming language are have all really come together to be able to go to this chat channel and just talk about, you know, day and night with this, this thing that we're building. Um, and so if, if you, if you want to get into the community, I uh, just, just join, just ask, ask for the Slack invite and we'll let, we'll let you right in. And you can, you know, if you want to start contributing or if you just want to start using it, um, just, you know, ask us questions, uh, have fun with it. Amazing. So thank you very much, Chris. I think uh, from what we have seen today, the Julia community seems very open and exciting and a really lively place to be. So I think uh, many of us will be joining soon. Uh, so yeah. expect people from Argentina, especially. Um, thank you very much uh, from, 
for being here. And to our audience, uh, please go to juliacon.org to listen to more amazing talks. And yeah, download the Julia language and start exploring. Uh, OK, so thank you very much, Chris. And yep, thank see you. you around. <laughs> bye. Yep, bye bye.